You know the day destroys the night Night divides the day Try to run, try to hide Break on through to the other side Break on through to the other side Break on through to the other side God bless America. Welcome to The Ranch, everybody. The podcast that explores the people and happenings of Dry Creek Ranch, Eagle, and the greater Boise area. Quick shout out to Dave Musgrave and Lean Feast. I met Dave at the health and wellness event that was going on down at the farm. Man, incredible food. He runs Lean Feast over here in Meridian. Incredible meal prep stuff. He brought some food by my house for me to try later because I didn't want to steal all the samples. And it was fantastic. I am a huge, unrepentant carnivore. I love cooking chicken. I love cooking beef. I love cooking pretty much anything, anything having to do with animal protein. And this was some of the best I've had. I actually shy away from eating out frequently when I'm going for something like a steak or whatnot because I can cook one really, really well at my house. But this food was really good. I'm going to have Dave on shortly here, hopefully, so you guys will get to hear some stuff from him as well. But it was fantastic. If you're curious about meal prep and curious about a service that can help you get some really, really tasty food, check out Lean Feast. And again, I'll have him on soon. I tried it. I really liked it. If you want to check it out, check out Lean Feast. Again, it's it's pretty tasty food. My guest today is a crypto consultant. Super interesting guy. Tons of knowledge around the crypto world. Everybody has been talking about crypto for a while now. And it's one of those things where I feel like so many people talk about it, but very few people actually understand what it is and how it's functioning. You obviously have tons of people running around that made a ton of money. I am not one of them. And it was just something that I really wanted to learn about. I am a huge fan of real estate personally, but again, I wanted to know what what was going on with crypto and this guy did a great job explaining it to me. It's definitely gonna be one of several because there are things coming out as you hear it later in the episode that will change the crypto world very significantly with regulation. But again, really enjoyed talking to him. Super happy you took the time to break it all down. But without further ado, the man, the myth, the legend, Dominic Galluccio. Explain the FedNow app because I just learned about so- this. From what I understand, the Fed now situation is a um, it's a testing ground for the central bank digital currencies. So let's just so I'm talking to a five year old, right? Okay, yeah. That now here's the thing: um, what the what people are fighting over right now, or what what the what the what the uh, economic struggle is is between something called um, did. Uh, Distributed ledger technology, aka blockchain. Okay. Okay. So blockchain can be used for some for a myriad of things. It's not just currencies. But most people, when they think of distributed ledger technology, aka blockchain, they're thinking about currencies. And so currencies is just the um, tip of the iceberg, okay. right? It's a it's a ledger. It's it's ledger technology backed by cryptography. Okay, back up with the blockchain, because everybody talks about blockchain as if mm-hmm. everybody understands everything about it. What is the blockchain? The blockchain is digital ledger technology that is backed by cryptography. Cryptography okay. is the science of encryption. Okay. Okay. So essentially a ledger, they're keeping track of things that's encrypted so we know everywhere it went. For sure. So you can't just invent something like that's not in here. It wasn't registered with us or like it's not part of the blockchain. So the point <clears throat> of a blockchain is to make it nearly impossible to change a transaction okay. or to change a – yeah, because that's what ledgers keep track of. They keep track of transactions. Sure. Okay? okay. Now, the cryptography is different for every blockchain network. Okay. So I can't explain each one. Sure. You know, there's there's um there's these three sort of um uh pillars of blockchain, right? There's security, decentralization, and the other one is um s- security, decentralization, and I forget the other one right now, but yeah, those. There's but the those point three. is, uh, the crypto cryptocurrency is uh, supported and protected by the blockchain, which is taking a digital recordation of every transaction of this stuff. That's right. the point. Great. And now the crypto is a de- is the de- is the decentralized version of 
ledger technology. Okay. And that's, and that's what makes it attractive to sort of the libertarian groups and the people who've, who've kind of gotten behind it. Um, as far as like, uh, the people who are, you know, cause when, when, when Bitcoin was created, it was created during the 2008 financial crisis. Okay. So that's when it became a thing, right? Is that people are tired of, uh, dealing with governments controlling the, the, the money, right? So they created a decentralized version, um, of, of currency. Now the problem with Bitcoin I would say is that it's not private. Like you can see on the blockchain where everything goes. So it's constantly being audited, right? It basically gets audited every 10 minutes. Every 10 minutes, the blockchain is updated with the transactions, where what addresses they went to, how much you can even go to an address and look at how much Bitcoin is on that address, right? And so there are cryptocurrencies that do private transactions, right? And those are a lot more complicated and they basically, but yeah, for the most part, most cryptos are public ledgers, right? And so that's what built the trust around it is that you can just look on the blockchain and see where our transaction went. Now, it's so it's not easy for somebody right now to know who has what address because those addresses don't have what's called KYC, which is know your customer. Right. And so the government is going to start pushing for wallets to all have KYC. So everybody knows where all the money is and who has it and, and who blah, has blah, blah. it. Right. And so in order to do that, they need to establish digital ID. Right. So you were asking about Fed now. Um, that's just the rollout for the central bank digital currencies, which is blockchain technology. Right. Uh, distributed ledgers, except it's a centralized version, right? It's not crypto, really. It's not the type of crypto that people wanted. People want people were attracted to Bitcoin because it's decentralized, which means it's a closed network. Nobody can come in and just like make more Bitcoin whenever they want. Um, uh, there's no single points of failure, which means that it's a closed network. You, you, the, the decentralized um, nodes that people establish um, are what um, make the network function. There's no government that you can go to or no person that you can go to to mess around with it. Right. Like the currency won't fail, right? For, for, like say that, or, or rather, there's not a government or a community that's in control of it. And if that government or community becomes compromised, it fails completely. So the the, the, the early cryptocurrencies will eventually fail. Like Bitcoin, I do believe, will eventually fail. Not because... Uh, but it won't be because of a government taking control over it. What's going to happen is um, its technology is just not going to be sophisticated enough to continue. Because here's the thing. With, with, with Bitcoin, the problem is it relies on something uh, on an archaic technology called proof of work. Proof of work basically means that um, you need... Um, you financially incentivize miners to um, use um, computers mm -hmm. to um, solve cryptographic puzzles. And they get rewarded for those cryptographic puzzles through Bitcoin payments. Basically, right. the network pays them in Bitcoin to use their to computers. A um, computer to mm -hmm. mine the blockchain. Okay. Um, so what's going to happen is it has, Bitcoin has these cycles, right? It's, it's, uh, it, 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 every four years, it cuts the mining rewards in half, which deflates the currency. That's why you get these huge, um, explosions in price movement because every four years it cuts down on the inflation. Okay, back up. So you have miners that are validating essentially Bitcoin Correct. constantly and they mm -hmm. get paid in Bitcoin. Fine. None mm -hmm. of my affair, right? And you have these massive Bitcoin mining facilities in, you know, tanker storage tanks in like Montana with air conditioners on them and people are making, you know, all kinds of money in Bitcoin. Fine. And you're saying the compensation every four years is decreased. So like, Cutting hey, out. look, miners, you're going to get paid less 
next year than you're getting paid now. Yeah, for you get every... less Bitcoin right. per okay. transaction. Okay. So how is that spiking the value of Bitcoin when they decrease the payment to the miners? Because it it, it cuts the supply down. It it artificially cuts the supply. So now, in... it artificially cuts the supply of the miners or the Bitcoin of the Bitcoin. So it's so. So right now, Bitcoin is flowing into miners and miners are selling that on the market at a certain rate, okay? Mm -hmm. And that's going to get cut in half every four years. I so thought you could you never make more or less Bitcoin. So, the, so, the, so when you're when you, in order, see, this is the, why Bitcoin is not very sustainable, okay? okay? Is because, and this is just my opinion, right? Sure. There's going to be people who hate me for saying this. There's going to be, it's called Bitcoin maximalists, sure. okay? And you know, they saw Bitcoin go from one dollar to twenty thousand dollars, and they became filthy rich off of it. And that 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 psychologically, they're all in. people. They're they're yeah. So, it's yeah same so. same with uh, GameStop fanatics, right? Like some people rode GameStop from like <laughs> fifty cents up to like nine hundred, and they're like, "This is it." That's uh, you know, that's going to psychologically affect people, sure. right? Like you're gonna if you see if you experience that sort of like bull run where you become obnoxious. Yeah, you're a convert. Rich. Yeah. You're a convert. Right, absolutely. So anyway, um, so nobody can make more Bitcoin, right? Great. There is a certain amount of Bitcoin that is set to enter the market over time. Okay. So by not, that doesn't mean that they're making more Bitcoin, more Bitcoin from the network is being distributed um, through the code. Okay. So there's still an inflation rate, okay? But that inflation rate has a cap and it's and you can't change that cap. Okay, so say there are a million Bitcoin today mm -hmm. floating around and mm -hmm. owned by whoever, it doesn't really matter. Tomorrow, they have to pay the miners, okay? Let's just say tomorrow they're like payday, whatever. Is there, a, is there now a million and one Bitcoin or is it still just a million? Yeah, so there's there's the 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 circulating supply goes up. Okay, every, so there is they, then they are then they are inflating it. Because the argument that I've heard for Bitcoin and crypto yeah, and Bitcoin in general is there's a fixed amount. Mm -hmm. There will never be more. And it's like, but that's not true. There is more, it's just not an unchecked or government controlled quantity that's going to be increased. So there will eventually be a cap. There will eventually be all of the Bitcoin in circulation. Right? Okay, so there's a number of Bitcoin yes. that that we will eventually yeah, get. Yeah, we to. haven't reached that yet. Oh, interesting. We haven't reached that yet. Yeah. No, okay, so the so Bitcoin's so, interesting. So there's always a there's going to be let's say a million Bitcoin, and right now there's only nine hundred thousand Bitcoin circulating, and we're getting closer to that hypothetical million mark. We haven't reached it, but there will never be more than a million in circulation at any at any point now or whenever yeah if the cap is a, let's say the cap is a million bitcoin sure right? um it, it yeah over time as we get closer and closer to that cap the supply the the, the mining rewards get cut in half right right so we're, we're we're slowly and slowly and slowly reaching that um that point and that and point, if you cut in half you'll never actually get there so now here's the thing right is that someday there's going to be no Bitcoin left for mining rewards. Mm -hmm. So that means that Bitcoin is going to have to, there's going to have to be some kind of change in the code, which can't happen because it's a closed network. So this is why you think ultimately someday, ultimately, it's Bitcoin, like Bitcoin is going to hit. I, just, I mean, I don't know what's going to happen to Bitcoin. Sure. I just, I don't understand it enough to know how it's going to address that problem. Well, we would just be guessing anyway. Right. Right. Like you don't, you, you can understand what there is to know about Bitcoin right now and just say, look, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I know what it is right now. Yeah. So explain this to me then. What was the problem in 2008 that spurred people to say like, we need a decentralized currency? Because uh, like, mind you, 2008 was terrible. I'm not, I, I was not happy about it. You know, I was self-employed as an as an SAT tutor at the time. I had invested in real estate, like a lot of people did, um, and you know, so it was a very tumultuous, rough time. Mm -hmm. But I was never like, "Damn it, this dollar in my wallet, this is the problem." Like, if only I had an imaginary currency that we all agreed had value to like buy my Pete's coffee, mm -hmm. right? Like, I didn't. 
I, I still haven't figured out. People are like, well, it's decentralized. Okay, what value does that bring to me as an average consumer? So that just means that, so the de- the fact that it's decentralized means that you don't have to worry about um, the banks and the government just artificially deciding what happens to the inflation of the currency or the or where it all goes. Like so, you know, the banks and the government during two thousand eight, the, they they all just bailed out the banks because the banks. Um, you know, mishandled their money, right? Right. So they were making speculative bets. They were all drinking the. Kool-Aid. They're turning the printing sure. press on, right? And that a lot, and that's that makes it um, so that anytime you accumulate a certain amount of wealth, they can always take you down a notch by just pressing the printing button. You know, they can they can find a way to play with your currency. They during um, and back during during Nixon, they um, influenced the price of gold by like pegging it to $35. So, you know, it's it's the fact that the they the point of 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 decentralized cryptocurrency is such that now you're putting the populace in control of the value of the currency and no government can just come in and take you down a notch whenever they feel like it. Um they're so not- so theoretically, the the idea is: let's say I make a hundred million dollars cash. Mm-hmm. I'm all liquid. Mm-hmm. I got this hundred million sitting in the bank, and the fear then for me, being this hundred million deep dude, is that the government's like, you know, screw Matt. He's been you know a little shady. What we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, we're gonna hammer inflation like we've experienced like the last you know year. Right, the government's not coming after me, but we've experienced inflation. And I had the conversation with my wife, which was obviously, hey. We whatever cash we have in the bank is distinctly less valuable now than it was yesterday. Like distinctly, not like an inflation rate of two or three percent, but when you're chalking up like eight, nine, ten percent inflation, like we're ten percent buying power less rich now than we were then, because that's just the way inflation works, and and that is manipulated by the government, right, or mm-hmm. whatever. So, and it's that, and it's manipulated by the decisions of the government. So we decided to peg the dollar to petroleum, right? So that puts the value of the dollar in the hands of these like, um, you know, uh, elite elitists, right? Like um, as of right now, instead of having our, our, our money tied to gold, which is a much more um, universally valued uh, uh, metal, right? It has some utility for electronics and it's also um, very easy to trace the amount of gold in circulation um so that makes it easy easy to um understand the value of it sure. on a universal level they pegged it to petroleum because um they thought that it would um create a higher demand for dollars right um and they did that through agreements with Saudi Arabia and all that okay and so that now now the value of the dollar is decided by freaking Saudi Arabia and, and countries that couldn't give a crap about about us. Okay, now, now the, the the value of Bitcoin though can mm-hmm. also be manipulated by mm-hmm. people that don't give a crap about me, right? Like, the, uh, um, there are all kinds of examples of people manipulating very well-to-do people or groups manipulating uh, world currencies, mm-hmm. right? And they, history has a lot of these. But you also, we have also had examples um, in the crypto world of in, in recent months, right? Like the last mm-hmm. year has seen uh, an incredibly yes. volatile crypto value, mm-hmm. right? Because people are messing with it. So the reason why it's volatile is because there just isn't a lot of money in it, right? So the the crypto market is like anywhere in between uh, $900 billion to uh, $2 trillion any given moment. Okay, so that's an extremely small market. So the less money that's in a market, the more volatile it is, right? So if I have a market of twenty dollars, how much money does it cost for me to double the value? Twenty dollars, right? right? If I have a trillion dollars in the market, it costs a trillion dollars to pump the to, to pump it up a hundred percent. So the the reason why it's so volatile has more to do with the fact that it's in its infancy. It's just a very new asset class, and yes, um, uh. 
the, the, the market is manipulated by the market makers, right? And you can, and there are um, people who influence the market, right? Um, now, is it going to stop people from ultimate, ultimately investing in crypto? No, because um, we're going to lose the value of fiat currency. So fiat currency is, do, is cash money, uh, is cash dollars, um, pesos. Sure, sure, sure. Right? That's fiat, Okay, and fiat is being printed into oblivion by every country, including the United States. So people are going to ultimately sell their dollars for assets because the dollars are not going to keep value. The reason why um, uh, the cryptocurrency market was recently very volatile is because of um, it's because of fear. Right when FTX crashed, it was because their to they had a token that they were using uh, called FTT, and that FTT token was generally backed by a Ponzi scheme. Right, so Ponzi schemes are just when you rob Peter to pay Paul. So if I wanted to run a, rob a Ponzi scheme, I would say if you give me a million dollars, I'll give you back a million point two. Right, right. And the way I get you your million point two is I just say hey. Give me right. a million point two, and then I'll give you a million point four. Give you your million point two, and then I just get the next guy Got to just pay. Yeah, run yeah, yeah. through the whole thing, right? And so that's what they were doing to um, influence the price of the FTT token. Then somebody called them out. Um, when that happened, there was an audit of some kind, and then everybody started at wanting their FTT back, or not their FTT. They wanted their their money back for their FTT. And once that happened, that crashed the price of FTT, and then um, and then that spilled out into all of crypto, right? Because everybody's pulling their money out of crypt out of these exchanges. The exchange when the exchanges go down, they they sell all their crypto, so that dumps all the supply onto the markets, and then that influences the prices, sure, sure, sure. right? And so so. Those, I mean, those manipulations are always going to be in place. Um, you know, if you increase the supply of something and, and d that supply doesn't meet the demand, the prices are going to go down. Um, now, can any one person just like print a bunch of Bitcoin and dump it onto the market? No. It's, it's the miners that are mining the Bitcoin. Um, they're getting rewards for it. And then there's like a, and there's a, there's an algorithm that runs on its own that will ultimately cut the rewards in half every four years. And that's what's feeding the crypto market right now is that everything flows into Bitcoin. Bitcoin leads the market. Okay. And then what happens is things, Bitcoin rotates into other cryptos that have served different utilities. So if you want to understand crypto, like, because Bitcoin is is like the tip of the iceberg. Every other crypto has so many different use cases. So, when you're looking at crypto, you think you want to think of it as like a train, as like a train network, like train Church railroads, right? So you got the network itself, which is the railroad, and then you have the trains, which are the tokens, and then you also have passengers for those trains, which are also tokens. Okay. So Ethereum, I think, is the easiest one to use because Ethereum has so many layer twos, which basically means that you have, okay, you have the Ethereum network, which is the railroad, okay? No tokens on it, just railroad, okay? Sure. Ethereum tokens are the train for that railroad, okay? And then there's so many um, Ethereum layer, so Ethereum would be the layer one. Okay, it's the train. It moves passengers. Sure. Okay. There's tons of Ethereum tokens, which are layer two solutions, right? Those layer twos are the passengers that get on the Ethereum trains and move other tokens around, right? So I can take an Ethereum token, right? And add a passenger to that token, like a stable coin. Okay, a stable coin being something like Tether. Tether is a a stable coin is pegged to a dollar usually. Okay, so it's a it's a it's a token that's designed 
to represent the value of $1 and not move from there. Okay, so I can take Ethereum, right, and move my stable coins from, from one person to another on the railroad, right, by using my Ethereum tokens as the trains that move Right, so you're moving dollars. You're taking dollars, converting them into some uh, layer of token, and then con and then yeah. the person on the other end of the railroad gets to convert them back into dollars. So you have yeah. this conversion. Yeah. So basically, what I'm saying is, um, let's say I want to I, I want to move my tether on the Ethereum network to pay you those stable coins. Sure. Right. It caught. It costs me a certain amount of Ethereum. To send those stable coins to you because I have to put them on the sure. on the train, the, sure. which is the Ethereum token, and <clears throat> run that on the ERC20 um, network, which is the railroad for Ethereum, right? It's the network, okay? So the, so the more, like, now, Ethereum is extremely inefficient. It costs a lot of Ethereum tokens for me to make payments, right? So it's... Uh, an Ethereum token right now costs like $2,000, right? It's going to cost me something like 0.3 Ethereum to send you any amount of stable coins. Right. So it's going to cost you 600 bucks to, to transfer some amount of, you know, digital money. Right. Now, XRP on the other hand, right? XRP, in order for me to send an XRP um, shipment of whatever payment, if I want to send you a payment in XRP, it cost me 0 0.00001 XRP to send any amount of XRP or whatever I'm uh, using, uh, whatever passengers I add to the layer two, right? So um, you can put a stable coin on the XRP ledger, right? The XRP ledger would be the railroad and then XRP is the train and then I can, the stable coin is the passenger. So it costs me 0.000001 XRP to send you $1,000. Right now, XRP costs like uh, 50 cents, right? So it's it'd be gonna very cost cheap. me virtually nothing. Right, it'd be very cheap to send a lot. To send you the passengers, which are the stable coins. All I need is 0.000001 XRP to send you something on the XRP ledger. Right. So, right. So that sort of explain like layer one, layer two, and then the network to you a little bit, a little bit uh, better. Right. But here's a question from a functionality standpoint. Okay. So say like, let's say I have a thousand dollars, right? Mm -hmm. My dollars, fiat currency, us dollars in, you know, I don't know, us bank, whatever. Mm -hmm. So I got a thousand dollars in us bank now, and I need to send you 500. Now, I can either hand you $500, you get the $500, you're like, here we are, I'm done and mm -hmm. done, okay? I could Venmo it to you, I could hand you cash, I could do whatever I want, mm -hmm. and that's virtually free, right? Or I could convert that into, let's say, XRP, and then transfer you through whatever means, whatever the coin is, mm -hmm. passengers, trains, whatever, and then you get it, and then you convert it back to US dollars. Or I have my $1,000 hanging out in XRP, Mm -hmm. And then I transfer some of it to you and you have it and it's hanging out. But at this point, w like w one, in order to dodge inflation, we mm -hmm. have to constantly keep the thousand dollars in XRP, which means it's, it is uh, vulnerable to fluctuations within the XRP market as far as actual dollar value, mm -hmm. right? And two, so you're vulnerable if you're hanging out there. And two, if, you, if you're hanging out there and you're like, okay, let's say XRP is stable, you still need to be able to either convert that back into dollars at some point, which mm -hmm. means you're going to be vulnerable to dollar inflation, mm -hmm. or every merchant has to accept XRP, right? So say I want to go to Albertsons. Mm -hmm. Well, I got to either convert my XRP back into dollars. And if the dollars have been inflated or deflated, I'm subject to that exchange now, whatever mm -hmm. that exchange rate is. Or Albertsons is like, no, 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 just swipe your XRP debit card and, and we're good to go, right? Like aren't, those are two really big problems with the functionality of, let's say, XRP or crypto in general. Am I, yeah. Am so it's in its infancy, right? Like nobody accepts crypto right now. There was, there right. was one merchant that I um, met in Colorado that um, 
uh, was running a head shop and they would take an, they would take a crypto payment. They were, and, um, the cool thing that, so what makes crypto, uh, what, what, what the utility of crypto is that I can pay you at any point in time in seconds, no matter where you are on the planet, you can be in Antarctica. I can pay you in three seconds with no third party intermediaries. Okay. Two things I will guarantee you. One, you don't know anyone in Antarctica. <laughs> and two, even if I did, which I don't, I would never need to transfer the money instantaneously because ain't no shit happening in Antarctica. <laughs> so like, I appreciate, I appreciate that argument, which I've heard, which is like instantaneous. You could be on the moon. It's like, fuck, I don't know anyone on the moon. Like, in my life, my stupid little life of like going from my house to jujitsu and then like to pick up my kids and back home, like I'm not like, oh my god, three seconds, hit send, ah, like it just doesn't. So the yeah, yeah I understand so, it has that ability, but so, it's like I had a fast car once. I never went over eighty, mm-hmm. right? Like, what's the point of having a car that can go one fifty? So you know, if you're stranded in Europe and all you have is your phone. When's the last time you were stranded in Europe? Stranded in <laughs> Brazil. What? Okay, that may have happened. But <laughs> like you don't have stranded. your listen, I would I would rather lose my entire medical history than lose my phone. You don't go like when's the last time you left your house, no keys, no ID, and no phone, and you just walked around the block. You are nobody. You don't fucking leave your house without your phone for here's an interesting snippet. That's the point, it, right? It, but like it, it, in, sur- in the medical field, in mm-hmm. surgery, it, uh, until recently, th- when people wake up from surgery, the first thing they did is like grab for their junk or like just make sure their body is in place, right? They're like, oh my God, okay, I'm okay, fine. Now, the first thing people reach for is their phone. They Like before they check to make sure their abdomen is intact and they're you know, like, they're like, where's my, oh, like they like, can't even, can't even put the thing in because like they're, <laughs> the, but my point is like, I understand these use cases, but like, how actually useful is that? It cross border payments, how instantaneously to Antarctica? Yeah, like so, this is part of the scam. They call I Grandma. They're like wait. Dominic's trapped in Brazil without his phone. We need ten thousand in XRP. I've actually, well, so I I actually recently experienced um, some hacks on my credit cards. Mm. Um, so I just lost like five thousand dollars in oh. credit line. Not okay. Not, yeah, don't. You, you, don't okay. to, you don't have to feel bad for me. Okay. okay? We're good. Well, I was um, faking it. I, mean, I don't feel bad for you. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah. So, I just lost $5,000 in credit line because somebody bought something on Amazon with my credit card. Sure. And I didn't – I don't use Amazon. I would rather support a small business or some shit. You know? I don't even – the last time I logged into Amazon was like a year ago or two. And you don't have kids yet, Because I absolutely yet. had to buy something on you Amazon. You don't have kids yet. Because I didn't <laughs> – yeah, no. And Talk I, about I, I, functionality. Like, right. you can't beat – like once you have kids or like a couple annoying dogs, like you just can't leave. You're like, I need more hand towels. Like my kid chewed or like my dog chewed through my hand towels and like ugh, I get hand towels here in like four hours <laughs> or like you got to go to Target and then you got to go to like whatever Target has and they don't have the same gray, but I could just reorder the same fucking hand towels I got last. Like the, the talk about functionality. That's why Amazon's so great. Like, yeah, yeah. I'd rather support a local business, but Target ain't a local business. Target's mm-hmm. like a corporate monster. Like where's the local hand towel shop within the, like a 10 mile yeah. radius? I mean, I'm, 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 tr- I'm, I'm definitely not going to support the biggest devil. I will support the smaller one. You know, if I pick your poison, I would pick my poison. Right. And I would rather take, uh, you know, if it's guns or knives, I'll probably take, I'll probably take guns. Wait, how we get, I was talking about hand (laughs) towels. It's fine. Uh, Whatever. Take your guns. It's good. It's fine. So anyway, I lost, so again, function, I lost $5,000 in credit line recently. Okay. Okay. If people were able to use crypto, I could just get money like that. But that's, you're talking about two different things. Credit line is you don't have the money, right? That's people loaning you the money. You can you can do credit oh. lines with crypto, I'm, I'm sure. Okay, but my point is this is a different thing. It, it, that's like saying I lost $5,000 in cash. And if I had $5,000, so uh, 5,000 conversion of thing. crypto. With crypto, I can, I can make it very difficult for somebody to um, steal from my 
my wallet or whatever I have, right? Because I can keep my, with credit cards, you have to give out your all your information at once. With crypto, I'm only giving, I'm only giving my address, right? I'm not giving you the private keys that unlock the actual um, wallet, okay? So like I can, I can send you payments with crypto all day to a gas station, to a shady mofo, okay? And they'll never have any information that allows them to hack into my accounts because my private keys can be stored um, without, I don't have to give somebody my private keys, right? Right. So, like so when you write a, when you write a check, it has the router number, it has your, it has your account it has number, it has everything. Shit. Right. Somebody gets a hand on your check, they could like jack your money. Like, right. Could happen. Okay. So with crypto, right, we have our wallets and those wallets um, have, have addresses that anybody can just look up, but they can't look up the private key that opens the wallet. Okay. Sure. So. So it essentially has a password. It's a password protected it's a, wallet. It's like a very long password. It's like a super long password. Okay, great. And it's that your password name with a one and an exclamation. You can mark. actually take that password and put it on a hardware device that stays offline. Right. So you can have it on an air gas so computer or on your you old don't iPod even know. or something. You can you can not even know the password or the the, the 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 um the private key, right? And all you and you can actually hide the private key behind a, a long pin number, right? So you open up your, your hardware device with your pin, and then that allows the, the, your phone or your computer to unlock the, the wallet with the private key, right? So nobody's getting your private information about how to open up your wallet. And they, it's, it's electronically impossible for them to hack it because your hardware device is offline. So, with crypto, I am way more secure than, than these cards because like any jackass account. at any moment can run my credit card because I was I gave my credit card to a gas station. Yeah, there was a I worked at Applebee's back in the day. A server, I had my flair and everything. Yeah, I, I was yeah. eighteen. I mean, so, and this, these, this guy, look at what these waiters do. They take your right. card. They walk away somewhere. Right, and that's what this guy. This that's what this guy asked. He's like, "Where are you?" So I go to get payment, and he's like, "Where are you taking this?" I'm like, "Oh, I'm gonna go run your card." He's like, "Where are you running my card?" I'm like, uh, right there. Mm-hmm. He said, "Great." Like, don't walk out of my sight. And I said, "Yeah, okay, no problem." He said, "I'm sorry, I'm a police officer, and we we deal with scams all the time where people disappear and they'll swipe they'll swipe a card on like their own private like yeah, getting yeah, the yeah. card number device yeah, yeah. and then you so know, with run crypto, it. Th- there it is. With crypto, I can scan your address, send you money. You don't get my information. You do get a little bit of you get like the address that it was sent from, but you don't get the private key, so you can't open up my wallet." So you have you have no ability to gotcha to scan. Okay, well then let me ask you this. I I get what you're saying. It's far more secure than having like a checking account. Yeah. So if you don't right. know how but to like, use crypto, you but, will get lose your crypto. But what? Where where is it in the future that we all walk around with these like crypto wallets saying like, oh, I have my life savings in Bitcoin. I'm not worried about the price getting cut in half or doubling. I know so that you can I can hold it in stable coins. You don't have to hold it in a um, in a volatile asset. Now the central bank now the Fed now and the whole like central bank digital currency push is trying to replace stable coins with their Fed centralized Fed coin. Now it doesn't right? really matter because a stable coin is pinned to the let's say a dollar. Yeah. Like one stable coin is worth one dollar, mm-hmm. and as long as we have to convert, we either keep it in stable coin, which means you're going to be subject to U.S. inflation or deflation. Right. right. So like, there's yeah, a, well, I, I'm trying to figure out like, what's the point in the world where we're like done with the dollar? Like the U.S. government, we're like, we need crypto because we have to stop our currency getting manipulated, which essentially means we have to stop our, our individual consumer buying power being manipulated by one government entity. And I just feel like there's really actually no point where that's no, going to happen. Ne- yeah, it's never. You're never going to. Capitalism is a casino at the end of the day, and where you put your money is going to be subject to all kinds of risks. It's just not. You're not going to ever be in that situation where your imaginary value, whether it's being held in gold, silver, 
guns sure. and ammo, sure, sure. crypto, whatever you whatever you hold it in is subject to some kind of volatility. You're not going to avoid volatility. Um, what we're trying to avoid is certain risk factors. We're not avoiding risk. You'll never right. avoid risk in life, let alone right. capitalist society where right. everything is subject to volatility. Um, what we're doing is we're just trying to narrow down risk factors. We're not, right. you're not going to eliminate risk. You're not going to eliminate volatility. You're hoping to manage the risk as you go. Yeah. yeah so yeah. I don't want, you know, president, uh, jackass, whatever, whoever's to, in office, whoever's in office to just be like, yeah, um, you know, uh, no more gold backed currency. Now it's all, now it's petrol. And then Saudi Arabia is like, ah, you know what? Well, we're, we're done taking dollars. Um, so now the demand for dollars has tanked or it will tank over the next few years, right? So in the next few years, in the next like five to 10 years, because Saudi Arabia doesn't really care about dollars anymore, you know, there, was, there wasn't there was anything holding them to dollars. They were, it seemed to be an advantage for them at some point. And now they're kind of going, you know what? We don't need dollars anymore. We can take you on. We can take... Uh, you can take shekels, you know, yeah, right. right? So now the demand for U.S. dollars is tanking, right? Now, that's a huge, like, crypto indicator. Um, the, you ever heard of the DXY? I mean, Do you, the dollar yeah. currency index. Oh, sure, okay? sure, sure. So the dollar currency index is just the dollar compared to a basket of relevant currencies. Okay. And when that pumps, crypto dumps, right? So the DXY goes up. Crypto goes down, right? Because the demand for dollars is going up, right? Mm -hmm. When the demand for dollars trashes, crypto goes crazy, right? And so that's a huge indicator of like you want your money in crypto for the next, you know, um, for the next uh, decade. Now, do you want your money in crypto because theoretically the value of crypto will go up? Because like we're investing? Because... Or, or do you want your money in crypto because that's going to be the safest place to be? Because these are two totally – like a lot of people talk yeah. about the functionality of crypto. But I think like 90% of people that own crypto are in it for the short-term investment. They're not mm-hmm. really in it for utility, right? Like as safe as it is and as you yeah. know, all these things, it's like they don't really care. They're like, look, it was a dollar and then it was 20000 yeah. And and I want to be on that next jump where it goes yeah. to like 100,000. It's 100, still in its infancy, but as people enter, as institutional investors enter the market, which will happen, um, the ca- court case you want to pay attention to is called the Ripple versus SEC lawsuit, right? Because here's the thing. Institutional investors are not interested in crypto right now because there's no regulatory clarity, right? So our ma- So right now we have a company called Ripple, okay? And Ripple um, you has adopted a cryptocurrency called XRP, mm-hmm. okay? And Because XRP can do cross-border payments in three to five seconds. Okay. Okay? So and what, what does Ripple do? Ripple facil- helps banking institutions facilitate cross-border payments okay. by eliminating escrow accounts and Nostro Vostro accounts. So they're like, hey, look, this is going to be our gig. We're going to help people transfer money, and we're going to transfer money not by converting it to dollars or, you know— PI in Brazil or, or the ruble, we're going to we're gonna transfer it using XRP. Here's the thing. Cross-border payments are a really serious problem for the banking institutions. It costs them uh, millions and millions of dollars in Nostro Vostro accounts, which basically just means that they need to have all this um, money in different currencies at any given time sure. because of multiple factors. So if when I'm when I, when a, when a bank is sending a cross border payment, where it has to convert the currency and send the payment at the same time, what it has to do is it, it that takes a two week process, and in that two week process, you have something called slippage, and slippage is when the currencies change in value. So in right. two weeks, that's enough time for currencies to change in value, which means sure. that you could lose millions of dollars right. just by making the payment. Right, two weeks is like a lifetime for for currencies. Correct. So. When that happens, there's a 4% chance of that currency through correspondence banking to just get hacked and lost and you have no idea where it is. So you can lose a, a you know, say you're making a $100 million payment to a different country from US dollars to um, shekels, right? Um, to, the, to some country that wants shekels, okay? 
Um, you got two weeks, right? There's going to be slippage. So now we're losing value overnight. And then um, somebody could hack it and then you just lose it all. Um, and so that means that you need to have Nostro Vostro accounts on both ends that cost millions and millions of dollars so that you can make up for those differences, right? And so you end up losing trillions and trillions of dollars every year in cross-border payments. Got it. XRP can send a cross-border payment in three to five seconds. So there's no slippage, right? So all I have to do is take my fiat, convert it to XRP, send XRP, convert it to fiat, done. done. Three, it's a, it's a, it's a five minute process, right? The, the actual payment is three seconds, but then you're converting it to dollars. So that's another like, right. So the slippage is incredibly reduced. Yes. It's so, like it's and, only a five minute window or something. Right. So now I don't have to invest in Nostro Vostro accounts. I don't have to have all this capital to send a cross border payment. I can just send you a payment and it costs me nothing. It happens instantaneously. XRP is extremely liquid. You can uh, trade it for a, a stable coin or you can trade it for US dollars on an exchange. Um, crypto also enables decentralized finance, which means that you can use the crypto networks on private wallets, not institutional wallets, not custodial wallets, such as like an exchange, right? I don't have to contact an exchange to do a trade at all. I can actually do from my wallet, my private wallet, which I have my own private keys for, which I am custody of, right? I can make a trade right then and there. Right, so I don't have, so it's like if I wanna buy a uh, million dollars of Coca-Cola stock, I gotta, I'm likely going to the New York Stock Exchange, I gotta get like, you know, a broker or somebody, it's, uh, somebody has to sell it to me, right? Yeah. Who's, who's like the middleman. But you're saying I could literally just have somebody who has Coca-Cola be like, hey, give me that thing. And they're like, okay, here you go. And we exchange our keys or numbers or whatever. And there you go. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so basically you're relying on code as opposed to um, institutions sure. to make trades, make transactions. And you don't have um, these like, you know, some CEO can't stop you from doing that. Okay, so that or, is the first real use case where I'm like, that makes a whole lot of sense. Like if mm -hmm. I'm sending a billion dollars to a company over there or they're sending me money and the exchange is a real problem, like a five minute exchange sounds damn good. So what is the Ripple versus SEC case? So um, because there's no regulatory clarity in the United States for cryptocurrencies because nobody is brave enough. Well, actually, that's not true. So here's the thing. Um, there have been regulatory agencies that do give some clarity here and there, um, but it's not enough for um, institutions to get involved just yet because we have the SEC, um, which is the Securities and Exchange Commission, right? So a security token, a security is, a, is similar to a stock, right? When, so, so learning financial lingo. Um, a lot of people don't understand what a security is. A security is an investment contract, okay? So it's like a Tesla stock. If I buy a Tesla stock, you bought a security. Sure. And a security <clears throat> is, um, is, a, is something that you can sue somebody over, right? It's not a currency, okay? Securities can be used, are, are used purely for investment purposes. So if you buy a security from Tesla, which is a, which is a Tesla share, right? Share, security, same thing. You have an investment contract with Tesla now, and Tesla has a fiduciary responsibility to make sure that they do their best to increase the value of the security that right. you own. Okay? These are currencies. Crypto is currencies. There's nobody is, you can't sue somebody for not increasing the value of a cryptocurrency. Right. right? So Sam Bankman freed screwing everyone. Well, slightly different. But well, the he point is like. He literally robbed people. Yeah. So that's bad. But that's what, not, like he doesn't, he didn't have a fiduciary duty to do something with the currency. No. So if Bitcoin yeah. tanks in value, I can't sue Sam Bankman freed. Right. I can't sue. Right, creator. just like if the dollar becomes inflated you and you know it's worth it's you worthless, can't sue the you dollar. You can't sue the government. You right. can't sue okay. the dollar. You can't sue uh, the the Federal Reserve. Like yeah, you right. Can't, there's nobody. Nobody's accountable. Right. Right. Okay. So the Ripple so, versus SEC. So there's the SC, no regulation so right now. The SEC 
is using the regulatory vagueness to do something called regulation by enforcement, which means that instead of telling you what the rules are, they just go around suing people. And so what they do is um, they, they sue you, right? And now the court system is enabled. But before the courts can reach a case law conviction, which would establish regulatory sure. clarity, right? They delay the case by filing for um, endless, um, endless delays in the case till the, the uh, um, till the per- the people that they're suing settles with the SEC for a hundred two five six ten million dollars. Okay, so what they're doing is they're running an extortion racket, right? They're using regulatory vagueness to um, just you know uh, extort people. Right. right. And and to get them. So, again, it's regulation through, uh, you know, lawsuits is essentially like, hey, I'm going to stop you from doing this, not because the law is behind me, but because I can make it so cost prohibitive for you to do this. And there's no right or wrong. Right. Like, because we don't know. It's too vague. Mm-hmm. I can stop you from taking these courses of action by making it cost prohibitive. So that's how we're going to regulate these things that are widely unregulated. Mm -hmm. And so I assume that's what's happening to Ripple. So the Ripple Ripple versus SEC lawsuit, right? Ripple is a $10 billion company. And the SEC thought that they were just going to sue Ripple and and then Ripple was going to find a way to settle with them very quickly. Problem is Ripple has a spine. They have $10 billion they can afford to fight the SEC. So now the SEC is about to lose power because we're about to establish regulatory clarity for the crypto space in the United States. Right, because if they don't settle, then the court system has to make some determination. And that lays the groundwork for like, okay, we now have some kind of regulation backed up by the system. Right. So that's about to happen, right? Uh, Once we get regulatory clarity, there's going to be tons of institutional investment over time, right? And so, yeah, you're getting in at the beginning, right? Like I, 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 I make sure that all my money is in crypto. I never have dollars on me. I, I use credit for everything. Um, and I, I take self-custody, so I never hold my money in a bank because the banks can just take your money whenever they want. They don't, they don't, owe, they don't actually owe you any money. It's their money um, in the fine print, right? That's like, at any point in time, what the part of the Fed now thing, right, is that they're going to start doing something called bank bail-ins instead of bank bailouts, where the taxpayer pays for the banks. Um, they don't want to do that, right? So they have already established. Janet Yellen has already said, "We're not going to bail you out," and that's in, in other words, they're saying we're going to bail you in. So bail-ins are when the banks are now allowed to take depositor money. And what they're going to do is they're going to take your depositor money and they're going to try to give you central bank digital currency. So why the reason like fiat no longer serves the banking institutions, right? They want to sell you um, a central bank digital currency because they um, they just want to have they want to have more control over the money and they're going to program your money. And that money is going to be programmed to, to digital ID, right? So if they, they first need to get you onto a digital ID before they can really control your money. So what they're going to do is they're going to start doing bank bail-ins. They're going to take people's money. They're going to, uh, they're either going to do it that way where they take your money and then they say, we'll give you back. We're going to give you back your money in the form of a central bank digital currency, right? And in order to get that, you're going to have to, go get a digital ID or some, some sort of loop or that you'll have to jump sure. through. Right. Um, or what they'll do is they'll just start disincentivizing cash, right. By charging, um, negative interest rates, mm. right. What they'll do is they'll take, it's going to cost you money to store your money. It's going to cost bank. you money. It's sure. going to cost you money to take cash out of the bank. Right. And then they'll also just, you know, steal your money by doing, you know, um, uh, negative interest rates on just holding in, in, in an account. Um, but they're going to find a way to corner you into getting a, um, 
central bank digital currency, um, whether it's through that or they have another thing called Operation Choke Point, where what they do is they they understand that there's these decentralized cryptocurrencies and they understand that there's there's um, people with gold, people with silver, people with cash, and what they'll do is they will narrow down your ability to trade those currencies without going through a federally uh, regulated banking institution sure. where they will ask you for a digital ID. Da, 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 da. Um, now, L- listen, let me ask you something. What? <laughs> I'm like a glass half full kind of guy. Mm-hmm. Do you think there's, do you think there's actually a point like in the next, like in the next six months? What do you think? Is there a way we could get a trajectory? Because I think a lot of people's eyes are opening to like, oh, this could happen or that could happen or like, you know, Fed's doing this, doing that. And I think people very largely just want some kind of bearing where it's like, all right, this is probably happening or it's probably not happening. Because if you tell me, hey, look, the bank can take all of my money right now. Mm -hmm. It's like, I mean, that I don't like that. But I also don't like the idea of like, going to buy a bunch of Bitcoin. So it's don't buy like, Bitcoin. Yeah, okay, fine. I don't like I don't like <laughs> buying any any currency. Honestly. It's kind of yeah. like it's not Yeah, no, I got like every, real estate. Yeah, I don't if like, you want to take self custody of your wealth, you have to accept volatility. Right? If I want to buy gold and store it in a safe, the gold the the, the value of sure. gold is fluctuating, right? And it's very stable, but you know, you're not gonna get like a ninety an eighty percent crash in gold. Like that's not gonna happen. Right. Um yeah. but you will get, you know, 10%. You will get 10% in either direction, right? Um, and then you also have assets, right? Like guns, ammo, um, sure. houses, you know, real Don't estate. Don't forget knives. You had knives. Okay. Knives. Knives. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's just the, that's just when you're holding something that in, in a... I mean, the, 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 tr- the trick with fiat currency is that it doesn't change in value they don't they don't they don't display the change in value for you right if you're holding cash in a bank the bank is not going to tell you that your your purchasing power is being diminished every single right that that's the thing you don't you don't have any gauge like the only way you know you can purchase less is when you try to go buy cereal and you're like oh i can buy less cereal with ten dollars right yeah yeah so i actually prefer to be in an asset class where i'm seeing the fluctuation because I'm at least living in reality. That would give me heartburn though, bro. Like I don't want to see, like it's already bad enough. Like you, you see property values come down. You're like, oh my God, what, what's happening to my house? But I mean, I, I guess house. it's you for still some... have the same amount of houses that you had before. Yeah, but that means different things. They They mean something different. Yeah, it means that your purchasing power for housing has gone up. So if you, if the, if the well, housing market crashes... You can you're you're in a better position to buy houses. Well, not necessarily, right? Because, like, not for instance, the recent the recent uh, decrease in prices were also paired with a doubling of interest rates. So, for instance, the house you can refinance. With, well, you're not going to refinance at a three and a half percent for a seven percent, right? And if you're saying you can buy at seven percent and then refinance at three and a half percent, when is it going back to three and a half percent? It will. Eventually, well, says who, well, like somebody, somebody. If you had told anybody a year ago, they're like, "Hey, by the way, interest rates going up seven percent." Mm-hmm. When they were sitting at three, you'd be like, "You're insane! That'll kill the whole market." Well, it did, right? Like we're still here. Mm-hmm. So I like I appreciate that. I think the idea. This is a real misnomer for I think a lot of people that are observing the real estate market. They're like, "I'm going to wait for the crash to buy the house." But what people don't take into account is. Why is the market crashing? What What is happening? Now, if you look at 2008, you had all kinds of turmoil in the mortgage industry, people making ridiculous loans that, you know, 110% of the house's value, but the people didn't care. They were going to refinance later. It was going to be fine, right? So you have that problem. But now the problem was, was so different, but still impactful. And, and the issue is in 2008, you couldn't get a job or find a buyer to save your life, right? Like we really needed jobs and there was nothing anyone could do to get out of that. Now we have too many jobs for people. Em- employment is through the floor, right? It's like 3% or something, astronomically low, but people, and 
the, we have still a contracted supply of housing, but interest rates are really high. And people don't want to move out of their 3.5% or 3% for a 7%. So sellers don't want to sell, right? They're kind of holding it out. Mm-hmm. Buyers would like to buy, but the cost of owning the home on a monthly basis is like 40% higher than it was. Even with a decreased price, it's still 40% higher than it was a year ago. So mm-hmm. people buying now, my argument is actually the housing market is far stronger than people recognize because anyone buying a house now is willing to pay on a monthly basis 30 to 40% more than the same person, same house a year ago mm-hmm. because the mortgage is no longer $3,000, it's $4,000 and they're still buying them, right? It's like the, the housing prices should have come down like 50% to match the the jack up in interest rates, but they didn't. Anyway, so there's like, Whenever people say you housing market crashes, you can buy more houses. It's like, well, it depends. It depends on a lot of things. Like, why is it crashing? What are interest rates? What's the banking industry doing? There's no, there's no silver bullet, man. No, That's there's no me. silver bullet. No. Yeah, once again, capitalism's a casino. It's not gonna. It's all, you're always taking on risk. You're always gambling, and you will make mistakes. You will lose money. It's I not, like that capitalism casino. I'm gonna. It's have a to, casino. I'm gonna have it's, to write that down somewhere. <laughs> you're you're always you're you're trading one risk for another. Yeah. Right. Like, like like if you're just holding your money in a bank account, the bank at any point in time can jack your money, and they're yeah. also hiding you from the fact that your the value of your currency is fluctuating. They're not going to show you the DXY next to your bank right. account. Right. So you're living in fantasy world when all your money's in a bank account. You're, but you're, not, you're, you're not you're you're not connected to reality. Oh my god, dude, listen to me. <laughs> Again, two things are true. One, you freaked me out thoroughly. Two, <laughs> noon class is coming up. I gotta go eat some oatmeal. I am down I, for some noon class. I so appreciate you coming in and explaining this stuff to me. You, Do you feel like you understand it better? A uh, way better, way better than I did. And I under more than anything, you've provided me with the first actual real fundamental use case for for crypto because like the world economy is not stopping right like i know we had problems with supply chains and everything but people are sending billions of dollars every single day and if you eliminate a headache to those international companies with crypto it's like okay i get it now that's really valuable Mm -hmm. because the whole like Oh, Matt, like, I don't like the idea that, you know, U.S. Bank can take my money, right? Like, that kind of freaks me out. I'm going to make a call as soon as we're done with this. Make sure <laughs> make sure everything's fine. Well, they're just going to, I mean, it's in the fine print. They're not yeah. going to tell you. I mean, and, and again, there are a lot of ways that that could happen, right? The money mm-hmm. could go away. But the point is, it, that makes way more sense to me now. Right. Mm-hmm. And and whether or not I ever get into crypto, which I may or may not have a choice. Oh, you with, will eventually be right. forced into it. Yeah. Right. Whether be it's going to be a central bank it. digital currency right. or whether you buy a, a, a cryptocurrency on the exchanges. Right. Because you don't want to be in a central bank digital currency. Right. It's kind of like the invention of consumer debt. Right. Like when people got out credit cards and stuff. It's not, it, nobody likes the idea of living in debt, but we all, unless you're just swimming in it, you know, like mm-hmm. most people have a car payment at some point. If you want to buy a house, like it's going to be exceedingly difficult, mm-hmm. even a modestly priced house to come up with a quarter million dollars, right? To just, so like we use debt. We were forced into a lifestyle that was centered around debt over a, a period of 50 years. And, you know, I'm sure we'll have, have some degree of that. But the bottom line is like, I see it much more clearly now, and and people will obviously make their own decisions based on their own casino gambling preferences. But it's mm-hmm. uh, yeah, it's just it's it's gambling. It's yeah. just it's just it's just gambling. But you're but the but you can actually win. Like well, if you go to a casino, chances know, are you're gonna lose. But we're all, uh, we're all gonna die eventually. We're all gonna <laughs> die eventually. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, let's do this again. I wanna I wanna do like a follow up. How far out do you think the Ripple versus SEC is? It's close. Oh, okay. It's close. No, no, no. We, we, we've already had two years of lawsuit. Like, okay. it's, it's, we're awaiting summary judgment. So, okay. So, what you, so there's tons of information that's already on it. So, all you have to do is look up Ripple versus SEC. Okay. Right? And you'll be able to easily research the developments of the case. Okay? And Ripple is in an extremely strong position to defeat the SEC. Um, their settlement terms are that they want regulatory clarity for XRP. Sure. And the SEC, if they give that over, they lose their power to right. extort to use people. Because they're not they're not committing to a position, so they get to keep messing with people. Once they have to commit to a position, then people defend themselves easily saying, hey, whoa, 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 I'm following your guidelines. You yes. can't do this. So then right. the courts will throw out their lawsuits. Right. 
right? Right. And so that makes it that makes them, you know, have to spend way less money in lawyers. All right. When this all comes out, let's do a follow up because I want to talk about that. So yeah, it's going to come out um, within the next uh, within the year. Like right. by by the but before 2024, we should have some sort of regulatory clarity. God bless it. That's gonna be <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Dominic. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Quick shout out to our sponsor, C Squared Social. C Squared Social is the leading expert in social media marketing and creative marketing. They have fantastic platforms. I have been a client of theirs for some time. I cannot recommend them highly enough. C Squared Social for all of your social media and creative marketing needs.